Hello teachers, students and lovers of poetry. Today we'll analyze bird shooting season. This is one of 20 videos in which I do detailed analyses, complete breakdowns, video lessons on the 20 CSEC English B poems. Today we're looking at bird shooting season. So first I'll read the poem and then we'll get into it. Bird shooting season by Olive Senior. Bird shooting season, the men make marriages with their guns. My father's house turns macho, as from far the hunters gather. All night long the contentless women stir their brews. Hot coffee, chocolata, seracy, wrap pawn and tie leaf for tomorrow's sport. Tonight the men drink white rum neat. In the darkness, shouldering their packs, guns, they leave. We stand quietly on the doorstep shivering. Little boys longing to grow up bird hunters too. Little girls whispering, fly birds fly. This doesn't seem to be a complicated poem. The speaker here gives us an overview of the preparations that are made by the men and women when bird shooting season comes around. We don't see the actual hunting happening, but we see how everyone gets ready. We get some anticipation and excitement. The men prepare the guns, the women make the brews, and the kids watch with wide eyes and excitement. Let's get in between the lines and see what poetic devices and themes we can find. We might even find some hidden messages. As usual, we start by taking a look at the poem's title. The title here is especially important as it also appears in the opening line. What is bird shooting season? This is, as the name suggests, a season for shooting birds. Diction like hot coffee, seracy, white rum, Thai leaf indicate that the poem might be set in Jamaica. However, we can't be certain of that. We're almost sure though that the poem is set in the Caribbean, in which the bird shooting season, the best time to hunt certain popular birds, is around August or September. So unlike some poems we've studied so far, this poem has a fairly concrete setting. Still looking at the title, it appears that the poem will describe a season, a range of time. However, the details of the poem are really about what happens on a specific night, the night before the bird hunting actually begins. We can assume that this kind of preparation night might happen every bird shooting season. Even though the title might sound a little innocent, we have to realize that shooting can imply violence, war, danger. Let's keep that in mind as we go forward. Also, it is possible that the birds being shot in the poem might be a symbol for something else. This is poetry, so we have to look for deeper meanings in the words. Let's jump down to the first two lines. Bird shooting season, the men make marriages with their guns. We have a metaphor here. The men aren't literally marrying their guns, at least I hope not. Instead, it means they become very attached to their guns. We also have some alliteration. Listen to the repeated mm sound in men make marriages, and even with macho in the next line. This alliteration probably emphasizes the connection between the men and the guns. So the men are about to hunt birds, and so of course, they hold their guns close. They're probably cleaning their rifles, checking everything, showing off their rifles to their friends, and so on. Let's look at how diction can introduce a theme into a poem. With men and marriages, the poem is starting to focus on gender, perhaps on gender roles, on the relationship between men and women, between manhood and womanhood, masculinity and femininity. The next two lines continue this language of men and masculinity. The speaker says that their father's house turns macho. This means the place is steeped in masculine energy. Hunting is a very masculine, very manly vocation. Saying the house turns macho might even be personification, as the house itself has become manlier. In the next line, we see that hunters from far gather. We get a little more alliteration with the repeated f sound. So these manly muscular men are gathering to prepare for the hunt. Are you seeing how masculine these lines are? First we have bird shooting, a masculine sport. Then we have the men marrying their guns. Then there's mention of the father's house. 
not the mother's, but the father's house. The father is the one who owned the place. He's the man. Then the house turns macho. Then we see the hunters gathering from afar. Note also that saying the men marry the guns is a way of saying that the women are being replaced by these guns. For the moment, the women have to retreat into the background as the men now have new partners, the guns. So even though the poem looks like it is just about hunting birds, we're seeing that it actually goes quite a lot into gender. In stanza one, we see how masculinity is portrayed. We see the job of the men, to gather and hunt, to kill birds and bring home food. That is what being macho is all about. Last thing before we move to stanza two. The diction so far, even though we are talking about bird shooting, seems to be hinting at a serious battle, a war. The men are gathering with their guns like an army preparing to face the enemy. But is this war really against birds? Or is it against women? Is this a poem about men versus birds? Or is it a poem about men versus women? We'll get back to this in a few minutes. In the next stanza, we finally get a look at what the women are up to. The stanza opens with all night long. Here we get the impression that the women are exhausted. They have been up all night. Also, the women are described as contentless. This is one of the most important words in the poem. We'll get back to it shortly. What are the women contentlessly doing all night long? They're stirring brews. They are preparing things for the men to drink while they hunt birds. They prepare hot coffee, chocolata, cerasi. They are also making wrap pone, which is basically a pudding, and a Thai leaf, which is a Jamaican pastry made of cornmeal and sweet potato. It is also called blue draws or dukunu. So the women are up all night toiling over the food. Is it food for them? Of course not. It is food for tomorrow's sport. They are making all of these so the men can eat and drink and have energy to hunt birds. The poet didn't just say that the women were up preparing food. Instead, she lists out all the different foods and brews being prepared. This is so we can understand that the women are making many things. They're busy, hard at work. But look at how the bird shooting is described. It is said to be a sport. It is all fun and games. So we see here that at least according to the women, or according to the speaker, hunting birds isn't really serious work. It's just fun for the men. But what the women do is actually hard work. Are the women happy to be toiling away in the kitchen? No, they are contentless. To be content means to be satisfied, to be pleased. These women are contentless, so they are not satisfied. They are not happy. It's like they are being forced to labor for the men, almost like slaves. The women in this stanza are at best reduced to unwilling domestic helpers. In the same stanza, while we see how the women are working hard, we see what the men are doing. Surprise, surprise, they are drinking white rum. We see here that they are drinking it neat. Neat here is a mixology terminology that means they are drinking the white rum poured straight from the bottle. There are no other ingredients. There's not even ice. So these men are drinking straight, undiluted white rum. They are there gallivanting, getting drunk, having a grand time, while the women are making the food in the kitchen. This picture represents a traditional gender role stereotype. The women are not happy about it. They feel trapped in their kitchen duty. Remember, they are contentless. By the way, we have a hard contrast here. Since within the same stanza, we have the women working hard, while the men are drinking white rum. Remember what I said earlier about the birds being a symbol for something? What if the birds the men are hunting actually represent the women? This is a gender war. The men are shooting. In other words, they are oppressing and caging and killing the women by forcing them into this gender role. While they drink rum and go out to hunt birds, the women have to stay in the background and do the actual hard work. They don't get to go out and hunt with the men. This is not a woman's sport after all, but a man's sport. Let's go to the next stanza. Here we move from the longest to the shortest stanza. The men in the darkness leave out for the hunt with their packs and guns on their backs. Again, we get a little more of the war imagery here. We can imagine an elite military team moving out in the dark, guns ready. It is dark because it's not yet daylight. These men probably want to be out on the hunting ground before sunrise. Look how quickly this stanza ends. We see here how the poem's form indicates the passage of time. 
The women spend a long time preparing the food, and so stanza two was long, while the men, as if they don't even appreciate the women's hard work, just get up and leave. So far, I've been interpreting the poem in a somewhat feministic light. I've put the gun to the men's heads, but before I pull the trigger, note that the poem does not really make it clear that the women are oppressed by the men. We get some hints that the women are frustrated or exhausted, or at least annoyed that they have to stay in and work while the men get to drink rum and hunt birds. But the poem does not say that this is the reality every day. We are only dealing with the account of a single event, a single night. On this event, in this season, this is what happens. In stanza 1, it says the father's house turns macho, which means it, it wasn't macho all along. Bird shooting season is just that, a season. It's not the whole year. So even though we can interpret the poem as making a wider commentary on gender constructs, we can also interpret it as only dealing with this particular event or season. Maybe in a different season, the men are the ones working, while the women are the ones having fun. It's up to you to decide how you want to interpret the poem. For the purpose of writing an essay, however, I think viewing the poem as talking about the oppression of women might be more interesting. Up to you. By the way, the diction in shouldering their packs is interesting. To shoulder something means to take liability for or to bear something. One can shoulder blame or responsibility, for example. It's as if the men are doing some great and noble deed by going bird shooting. I think the word shouldering here is used ironically. The speaker is being a little sarcastic, because while bird shooting is just a sport as we see in the previous stanza, the men act as if it's a great responsibility, a serious duty. Let's finish up. The women and the children, as the men leave out, stand quietly at the doorstep, shivering. It's dark and cold. They are shivering. The brave, valiant men have gone out into the cold, while the women and children stay behind. The women's quietness might metaphorically represent their lack of a voice. They cannot express their discontentment. They cannot voice their opinion, their frustration, as the men have power over them. Well, that is one way to look at it. It could just be that they are quiet because they are watching the men leave and they are thinking about how much they are going to miss their husbands. Also, the girls might be shivering because they fear for the birds that are about to be killed. The boys might be shivering in excitement and anticipation as they want the men to return with great stories and many dead birds. They might also be shivering in excitement as they anticipate becoming bird shooters one day, just like their fathers. Here we see that the gender roles promise to be perpetuated. The boys will become men and the cycle will go on and on. Let's go back to the little girls. They are whispering, fly birds fly. These little girls aren't as rough and tough as the boys. They are soft and kind. They just want the little birdies to escape. Their whisper could also be seen as a voice that is chanting for the women to escape the captivity, the oppression of the men. The whispering could mean that just like the women, the girls aren't allowed to really have a voice, and so they have to whisper. It's up to you to decide what it means. Either way, we have an almost tense, eerie quietness. The women are silent and the girls are whispering. The boys don't speak at all. They might just be looking out into the distance as the men disappear. They might be anxious or excited about the hunting that will soon happen. They might also be exhausted and too sleepy to talk. As I mentioned earlier, while you can interpret the poem as saying that women are oppressed by this patriarchal society, you can also read it as just a narrative description of how these people prepare for bird shooting season and what the duties of the men and the women are. Also keep in mind that the speaker of the poem is not a man. The speaker is left behind on the doorstep shivering, so they might be a woman, a boy or a girl. The my father in stanza 1 might hint that the speaker is a child, but grown women can have fathers too. In some households, three, four, even five generations live under the same roof. Seeing how mature the speaker sounds, we can also consider that the speaker might be a woman. A woman has been telling us all of this, so how can we say that women are voiceless? Maybe the woman here is just a little annoyed that she can't go out and hunt with the men or that the men won't make their own brew and cook their own food. Finally, let's look very briefly at the poem's form as we summarize how the poem presents its narration. 
Stanza 1 with four lines introduces bird shooting season and the high testosterone of the poem. The next stanza is the longest because it describes the most of the labor, the work that happens, which is in the food preparation. The length of the stanza and even the length of the first line of the stanza indicates how busy the women are. The third stanza is the shortest because all the men really have to do is grab their bags and head out. The women have already done the hard work. The final stanza is the second longest with five lines. It gives the personae on the doorstep enough time to reflect on their positions as the men leave out. We'll call it a day for this poem. Not the most difficult of poems as you've seen. See you in the next analysis. And if you liked this video, give it a like.